how to sign up a bit later. Uh, if you're an educator, this is kind of an introduction to how Tomato Sphere will be run in your classrooms and maybe some ideas and, and how you can maybe incorporate some of this stuff into your teachings. So uh, yes, as Helen mentioned, I am a PhD student at McMaster University. So uh, tomatoes and plants are not my specialty, unfortunately. I study the human heart. Um, so it's slightly different, but I can, uh, I can uh, teach you guys something about this stuff. So let's start off with something in the recent news. So if you haven't heard, uh, recently there was a new Mars rover that landed on Mars uh, called Perseverance. And this uh, presents a cool, interesting uh, scenario where we're starting to explore uh, outer space and we're starting to explore new planets. So uh, as we're exploring outer space and as we're learning about different places we can go to, one interesting thing would be how can we inhabit these new places? How can we expand our human population and um, travel to these places, potentially start a colony there and maybe uh, live there? So I was hoping this would be a bit interactive. So uh, if anyone is in the audience would like to potentially unmute themselves, um, we can maybe try to uh, add some fun into this presentation this Friday afternoon. All right, so can anyone tell me uh, what are some differences or similarities uh, to Earth and Mars? Um, maybe uh, if no one has any, I can throw in some facts in here. Anyone out there? So if you use the, um, there is a feature that reactions, you can put your hand up and I will unmute you and uh, we'll work that way. So. We don't have chaos with everybody talking at home. Yeah. But if you wish to participate, just put your hand up and I will unmute you. Oh yeah, or you use the chat box. Yeah, so Allison mentioned that Earth and Mars are both planets. Yeah, so we, oh. pen tool, there you go, planets. Well, that's perfect. Yeah, so Earth and Mars are both planets. Um, so that means they, uh, actually, Earth and Mars share a very similar size and of planet. Uh, so that makes it an interesting proposition for us to colonize in the future. Uh, it's close to the sun, yes. Yeah, so it's it's our near neighboring planet. So that means it is uh, it is still within. It's not quite within a habitable a habitable zone, but uh, we are able to potentially go there and potentially step foot on it. Um, so uh, one, one interesting thing is they have roughly uh, the same amount of time in a day. So there's roughly 24 hours in a day on Earth and Mars. Forgive my horrible handwriting there. It's hard to write with a mouse. Um, but what's unique about Mars? So Mars is actually fairly cold. So the average temperature on Mars is minus 63 degrees Celsius. And the average temperature on Earth would be uh, room temperature. So around 24 or 25 degrees Celsius. So there's a temperature difference. So if we were to live on Mars, we'll definitely bring some extra sweaters. Or if you're a Canadian, then you're fine. Um, <laughs> uh, some other differences and uniques. Um, is there water? Well, we, there might be. There's uh, some evidence that there's water underground, but there's no surface water. So you might need to consider that. Um, yeah, so there's some other differences, um, but these are all the kind of things we need to consider, like the gravity, the water, the soil. Um, if, if we're gonna travel to Mars, what will we need to consider? So that's kind of where uh, the Tomato Sphere program is kind of born. Um, there's all of these future questions that we kind of want to answer if we were to travel out into space or onto a different alien planet. And how would we live there? What are some things that we need? Uh, we'll definitely need um, a spaceship to get there. We'll definitely need oxygen so we can breathe. Uh, but most important thing to actually live there, we're going to need some shelter and most importantly, food. 
And for food, we have a bunch of options. Obviously, we can bring our own food, uh, but that's going to be very expensive. That's going to be very hard for us to load tons and tons of food onto a spaceship uh, and fly it over. And every time we need food, we're going to need to send more. But one different way of doing it is what if we can grow uh, our own food on Mars or in space? Then we wouldn't need to rely on Earth or any other people. We can just grow our own. So tomato sphere kind of answers that. And I have a neat video kind of introducing tomato sphere. Just do it better than me. So let's, uh, let's see, hopefully this works for everyone. Hi, I'm Thomas Pesquet and welcome aboard the International Space Station. Uh, my crew and I arrived in a Russian spaceship called the Soyuz uh, and it took us two days to get here. And I will spend a total of six months in, in my new home in space. So in the future, uh, astronauts will travel to destinations much farther away, like Mars, for example. Their trips could last two or three years. Before we can travel that far, we need to rise to some important challenges and we need your help. If you were an astronaut heading to Mars, think about some of the things that you would need to stay healthy. Let's talk about food. Whether on Earth, Mars or the Moon, we all need fruits and vegetables. But fresh food only lasts about a week. We would never be able to carry enough for a three-year mission. So we need your help to develop a new skill, space farming. We're already growing lettuce here on the space station, but no salad is complete without tomatoes. Tomatoes are delicious and nutritious. They taste and smell great. Plus, tomato plants could benefit our environment by removing carbon dioxide and adding oxygen and water to the air we breathe. Tomatoes could be a space superfood. And this is where the tomatosphere comes in. Will tomatoes grow the same in space that they do on Earth? Help us find out. Count how many of your tomatosphere seeds germinate and send us your results. Who knows? Maybe you will be studying how to grow the food that you will one day eat as an astronaut. Cool. Well, that was a great introduction to what Tomato Sphere is. So essentially, it's a program that uh, teachers uh, can bring uh, into their classrooms, and students will basically be going through the scientific uh, method to observe, question, experiment, uh, and analyze various kind of aspects of tomato growing and seeds. So some of the things that was brought up in that video to kind of, uh, to kind of initiate the scientific inquiry is what are some things that we need to worry about uh, when, if we're gonna grow something in space? Uh, well, first thing, if we're traveling to Mars, um, like the astronaut mentioned, we, it will take two or three years. So one thing we're going to need to worry about is uh, the potential exposure to radiation from outside um, in space. Uh, what are some considerations for gravity? Can we grow things if there's no gravity? Or do we need to generate some gravity? Um, what about soil and water and light and all of these different things? So to kind of, to kind of help solve some of that, let me turn my slide. Uh, we want to engage in something called the scientific method and the scientific inquiry. So this is essentially how scientists such as myself and many others will go through and answer some of these questions that we develop and kind of find out what is happening and how we can solve problems. Uh, so this scientific method is essentially uh, a multi-step process where we start off with an observation or start off with something that we want to solve a problem, essentially. Um, and then we come up with a question, we develop some predictions or guesses or hypotheses, and then we want to experiment. Uh, we want to test our question, like test our predictions. Uh, finally, 
we observe and analyze our experiment, and then we come up with results. So for the tomato sphere, the question that we wanna answer is, how does exposure to the space environment or space-like conditions affect uh, the number of tomato seeds that germinate? And, and a simple way to put this is, how does outer space affect seeds and plant growth? That's our overall topic. And the tomato sphere was basically thought up and envisioned um, uh, by various space agencies uh, and various science outreach programs. And they basically brought some tomato seeds up into space. Um, I believe they're constantly doing this. There's always seeds going up in space. Um, and some seeds will be returned and be given to you guys who sign up for the tomato sphere program. So to get started with it, uh, it's quite simple. Um, I'll kind of go over some of these details later at the end. But basically, you go to our, the tomato sphere website tomatosphere.lessocscience.ca. Uh, you register, you order the seeds. Um, so if you are an educator or teacher uh, at a school, you basically will register your class um, and the seeds will be sent directly to you. Uh, there are some tiny things that you guys will need to get on your own, such as some pots, some soils, some maybe mini shovels, and you'll be planting these seeds. And then your students will be observing and recording the results. Uh, and afterwards, you can send the results online uh, on our website. So going back to the scientific method. Um, so we had a question. Our question was, how does outer space affect seeds and plant growth? Um, next, uh, the next step there is hypothesis. So we wanna develop something called a hypothesis. So essentially a hypothesis is not quite a prediction, but close to it. It's not quite a guess either, but it's basically a statement or an educated guess on what you think the answer to your research question might be. So ideally the students will be able to come up with something like this. But as an example, a hypothesis is typically something that starts with an if, uh, and then a result happens because of something. So for example, if children eat more vegetables, they will grow quickly because vegetables provides nutrients for growth. So essentially this is kind of like a guess, kind of like a prediction, but it's more of a statement of the answer to your question. Um, so once again, our research question for, our for the tomato syrup program is, how does exposure to the space environment or space-like conditions affect the number of tomato seeds that germinate? Um, let's see, maybe in the interest of time, I'll just give away what a potential hypothesis might be. So if we start off with the if statement, if tomato, sphere, uh, tomato plant seeds are exposed to the conditions of space, then fewer seeds will germinate than non-space seeds because radiation levels found in space may damage cells in the seed or may damage the seed. So essentially this is an example of a hypothesis we can come up with based on our research question. So kind of a prediction of what we think might happen in our experiment. So we have our hypothesis. Next, we actually need to test something. We actually need to conduct the experiment and find out what the results of our hypothesis or and question are. So the tomato sphere uh, basically helps us with this. Um, so to actually test whether or not outer space affects seeds, we're gonna need two different sets of seeds. Uh, one set, which you guys saw in the video and in the photo, was a set of seeds that was sent out into outer space. Uh, They're exposed to space-like environments and they were floating around in the International Space Station, and then return back to Earth. But then we also need another set of seeds. Um, and these set of tomato seeds were left on Earth. Um, and they serve as something called a control group. And the control group will let us determine whether or not there will be any differences uh, between normal seeds, which are the ones left on Earth, and the ones that were sent out to space. Um, and uh, 
another thing about these seeds is you'll be sent two packs. Um, your class will be sent two packs, I guess. Um, it will also be a blind study. And what that means is uh, you don't know what the seeds are. So you'll have one pack of seeds with a letter, so let's say L that we can see here. Another pack of seeds will have the letter K, um, but you don't know which, which seeds are those. So for students, this will be kind of interesting to kind of learn about uh, what a blind study would be, but also learn that, well, these two seeds, you don't know what they are. So you're gonna need to observe and figure out if there's any differences. So I have another video kind of kind of over kind of going over some of the stuff I just mentioned and how it works, how the tomato sort program works and how to sign up. So Right, so that was pretty straightforward. So you're gonna be sent two packs of seeds. Uh, uh, the, all the other materials are some things that you may need to gather at say a local Home Depot. Uh, I found it at a garden nursery place off in Hamilton. Uh, basically you just need some of those peats uh, and ideally a large container um, to hold those peats in and then water. And you won't need soil until later, uh, until the plants grow. If they do grow. So kind of back to that. So that was kind of running the experiment. So when you're running the experiment, um, there are some things that you're going to need to write down. And this is your analysis or your observations. So I'm not an expert on this. Um, <laughs> I don't really know too much about plant growth, but uh, there's some things I guess we can just kind of cover the background of. So these are cut up tomatoes and we all know tomato seeds are found kind of within the middle there. Um, and these seeds undergo something, a process called germination. And germination is essentially when these seeds, when there's the right environmental conditions such as water, some soil, place to grow, some warmth, some light maybe, um, these seeds, these seeds, which are normally dormant or kind of asleep, they become active and they start growing. Um, so uh, these are some fancy words, which I don't quite know, but basically this is the germination process of a tomato plant. Uh, so I have another quick activity for those in the audience. Um, what order do you think uh, a tomato plant growth is like? So just quickly, maybe throw in combination of letters. Of what do you think it is? I'll give you guys, give you guys a few seconds. <laughs> oh, got an answer there. All right. So B, E, D, A, wait, I can't read. <laughs> B, E, D, A, C, B. Perfect, I think that's correct. Let me, see. all right, so our next slide, yes. So uh, yeah, we start off with B, we have our tomato and we basically pluck out the seed and then you'll take the seed and you'll plant it. And as it germinates, it'll start growing and out of the soil you have your beginning plant. And then as your plant grows, it's gonna start to flower. And this flowering will attract uh, insects such as bees to pollinate these flowers. And as these flowers get pollinated, 
they'll grow fruits. And in this case, they'll grow tomatoes. And basically, if you cut open one of these tomatoes, you'll have plant seeds in it. So yeah, exactly. It's basically a cycle. So this is the plant cycle that we can see here. Um, so that's kind of one fun thing that you can observe about the tomato plant. You might be able to see it growing. Um, so when it starts to grow. So there's other things that students can also record down uh, if they like. Um, how fast do they grow? So they can basically measure the length of the stem and see how fast it grows. Uh, are there any difference in color um, of the leaves or of the, maybe the plant itself or maybe even the tomatoes? Are there different sizes after a certain amount of time? So these plants will, it'll typically take a few weeks to a few months, depending on how long you want them to grow for. Um, uh, but you can basically measure to see if there's differences in the different seeds. Uh, we can also see, look and see uh, how big the certain leaves are or how big the tomatoes may be after a few months. Uh, so after you have some of those results, after your classroom has collected maybe a bunch of those results, you can basically submit these results uh, onto our website. And then essentially your class would have been part of an important scientific uh, research there. So it's pretty easy to sign up uh, if you're interested. Uh, you basically uh, go to this website and you press uh, order seeds today and you'll be sent uh, two packages of seeds. So like I mentioned before, all, all you have to do is go out and buy some peats, uh, buy maybe a tray and I think that's basically it. You don't really need anything else to start off. Um, if you want to continue growing them in your classroom or if you want the students to take them home after, you may need to get some pots or some soil for you to transplant them into maybe a small pot there. Um, maybe for the interest of time, I can stop here, but I do have some slides that kind of talk about Let's Talk Science outreach in general and some other programs that uh, us here at Make Master run out. And if that helps the educators that are watching here, I can kind of go through them or parents that are interested in kind of engaging their, their kids in other programs as well. But I can answer any questions right now if there's anything about tomato sphere. If not, I, I'll just keep on talking. <laughs> sure. uh, why don't uh, we do a couple of questions and then you can show those slides. And then if we have more questions, we'll go back to that if, uh, if we can do that. Um, so if anybody has a question about the tomato sphere project, please enter it in the chat box and I will ask Alex on your behalf. Uh, I know I have a couple of questions. Um, yeah. <laughs> one of them. So. Um, is it only schools that you're allowing to do this? So um, uh, like Halton Food runs um, outreach programs where we have kids gardening. So we wonder if we can engage those kids. I run a junior gardening program through the Oklahoma Horticultural Society. So I'm wondering if we can get those kids to grow it. Is it uh, school groups uh, specific? Yeah, so I mentioned school just because I wasn't really sure what the audience was. But yeah, uh, it's open to any group of students. Um, we mostly target in groups like uh, so such as your Halton Foods program. That's perfectly fine. Uh, you can sign up for that. Uh, we can do after school programs or anything. Uh, the only thing is we're not sending them out to individual parents uh, who want to run it. So like small groups of like two or three kids, that's probably um, we wouldn't be able to send seeds out to you guys, uh, fortunately. Uh, but yeah, any other groups is totally fine. Just go on the website and you can order them. Good. Um, and are, do you have any preliminary results? Um, or is it still you don't know? Or I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think I think they're keeping the this pretty tight lip for now. <laughs> um, that's actually a good question. I wonder if I can pry that away from. Yeah, no, no, they're not. They're not telling me anything. <laughs> So it's been going on for 20 years though? Like that's- uh, I think it's, that's a good question actually. Um, I don't feel like it's been going on. I think, I think it's only been 10 years or in the last 10 years. Um, maybe it's been thought of for the last 20 years. I'm actually not entirely sure about the timeline of the program. 
Uh, oh, Dr. Dixon started in 20. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it's been a long uh, running program. Uh, so there's definitely our results there, but I think it's interesting to see how different conditions maybe on earth can also affect these seeds. So maybe different classrooms, different locations, uh, different conditions of light. So there's so many different variables involved, I guess, as you guys know, in plant growth, that could be interesting to see how all of this gets put together. Yeah. So uh, sorry to get back to your um, groups, because we have a question. What is your minimum number of kids that you need? To oh, yes. So I don't think there's a cutoff, like ideally probably 10, because you're I know, I know I opened one of these packets of seeds before. There were quite a lot. I think there were 20 seeds in each pack. Um, so obviously you can plant them all if you have a limited amount of students. But uh, ideally, I think how we typically run it is each student will get their own plant. Um, just uh, obviously for space can, considerations, you probably can't have 40 plants growing at once mm -hmm. if you're in a classroom. But um, I think just try uh, signing up. Um, usually the National Let's Talk Science Office will kind of coordinate that you, with your program or classroom or group. Yeah. Hmm. Now, I don't know too, too, too much about it, but I know I'm taking a course right now. Um, and one of the subjects we're touching on is phytoremediation, which is using plants to clean up contaminated sites. And we got on the discussion of plants in Chernobyl, where well, Chernobyl, mm -hmm. that area. And they're finding, and this is only one or two studies we've looked at, but they're finding that the plants and trees aren't as affected as people thought they would be. Uh, do you know too much about that? Uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I know I don't, unfortunately, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> <what> um, <laughs> but it, it's kind of that, the, the fact that they're studying um, how radiation uh, from, from those don't really affect plants may be similar to what it's like out in space. That's, that's there's radiation out in space too from various stars. Um, so if seeds and plants aren't affected too much by radiation here on Earth, then it might be the same thing out in space as well. Yeah, there was a couple of yeah. reasons. One is that the plant cell wall, as anybody who's teaching, I think it's grade four science knows that that plant wall is rigid and it's not like human cells. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't allow that um, mutations to kind of cross that same way. And with plants too, every, that's why you can do all these cuttings and get a new plant because every cell will grow into a new plant. Whereas in humans, like it's kind of, after a certain point, it's going to be only a certain body part, but it's not, uh, it's, unless it's a stem cell, it's not going to grow into just anything. And they're also finding that, well, the, the thought is, is that at the beginning, uh, when the earth was evolving, that there was so, a lot more radiation than there is now on earth and at the site of Chernobyl, that uh, the plants have just adapted and have that in them since way back then, that they're just not as affected because of those conditions back then. So that's just, uh, but if anybody wants to, uh, you know, add their own thoughts about that, or if anybody else has been looking into that for sure, add that into the chat room and, and let us know. Um, otherwise, please ask any questions of Alex right now. If not, we'll let him uh, show us all these other very, very interesting things to get involved in. Like these are really cool. How many kids do you have involved? How many schools are doing this? Uh, so I think I have some slides that talk about that. We have, we cover a fairly large region because McMaster is only major university. Oh, okay, I don't want to say that, but <laughs> uh, we, we do have a large uh, student base that covers um, the greater Hamilton region. So like Burlington, Oakville, we went up to Milton uh, and we go down all the way down to like we like Simcoe and like St. Thomas. Um, Oh, it's a huge area. So a lot. Yeah, of and then we have a lot of uh, different programming. So science, uh, technology, engineering, mathematics. There's so many different kind of topics. So we have some, we have some workshops covering kind of each of those subject matters. Well, uh, yeah. we'd love to hear more. So show us those yeah. slides. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I get on to it. Um, yeah. So uh, make so let's talk science is actually a national program, uh, but it's each university has its own kind of site. 
So there, it's mostly it's mostly all student run. So uh, either graduate students running the programs and undergraduates and other graduate students volunteering. Um, so a lot of these programs are run out of the universities themselves, uh, all student run. And so at McMaster, we have five coordinators. Uh, so I'm in charge of reaching out to educators, um, such as those potentially watching, um, and uh, kind of running some special events. Uh, at McMaster, we also have a bunch of volunteers uh, covering science, engineering. We have some students also in business and arts uh, that wanted to also uh, do some outreach. And we also have some graduate students too. So PhD students and uh, master's students who also can share their expertise. And like I mentioned, we covered a broad like region. Um, so we go to Milton, we have gone to Oakville, uh, Brantford and down in Grinsby and Hamilton and South where Caledonia and everything is there too. So we definitely covered the whole region. And we have currently reached out to a bunch of educators, um, mostly from K to 12. Uh, we also cover some after school programs. I don't know if that's on here, but uh, after school programs, uh, scout groups, um, community programs, uh, such as Pathways to Education as well. Um, so yeah, we definitely, we definitely have stretched our volunteer base uh, to kind of reach out to these. Um, different regions. Uh, so what we basically do, let me see if we can get to that slide. I don't, the slides are going back and forth. Um, is we have a bunch of these uh, kits or workshops essentially that, so if you're an educator, you're interested, or if you're a parent or even a student and you want to kind of run some of these activities, uh, basically you'll request one of our kits. Um, or, and request a time, time slot. And what we do is we'll, well, what we did pre-pandemic was we actually would go to these classrooms, uh, come prepared with all of these materials and activities and kind of run uh, these activities with your students. Um, uh, now that we're kind of doing things virtually, we do have some virtual kits available and we'll just kind of talk about them over Zoom uh, as a webinar or and have some interactive activities during that Zoom meeting. Uh, what we also do is we also run a bunch of special events. Um, kind of if you have if you guys have anything that you guys always wanted to run but maybe didn't have the resources or the the volunteers or maybe the expertise, uh, we have run some special programs for classes. Um, but some of our other special events, uh, such as the ones I listed here, Mac Engage, which kind of talks about psychology uh, for students, uh, that's, or neuroscience for students. Uh, MCYU is some, another group we partner up with. So they stand for McMaster Child and Youth University. So basically uh, lecturers or professors from McMaster University will basically be giving a lecture to students and uh, afterwards, we basically run activities based on those lectures. Uh, we're also running something interesting called Fishing for Science, where we basically go out into Hamilton Harbor and catch some fish. I don't know quite know how we're going to do that this year, but <laughs> uh, we're kind of doing some more virtual work with that. Um, and we also run, if, if you're an educator in high school, we run basically symposiums or and workshops. So Let's talk cancer, stem cell talks, and molecular biology workshops are all geared towards uh, high school students from grade 12 to, from grade nine to grade 12. And we cover some of the more complex science and biology and also some research too. Uh, and we also go out to festivals um, and just kind of run some fun activities there. But a bulk of our outreach is running those in-class workshops with community groups and school classrooms and stuff like that. So if you guys are interested in finding out more, um, we do have our own social media at McMaster. Uh, but if you wanna find out about Let's Talk Science overall, you can, and it's outreach, you can go to the national website. And then uh, if you're interested in reaching out and maybe requesting a visit or a virtual visit from us, you can send us an email. Uh, or visit our website, which is actually not on here, which I should probably put that on. 
but if you just Google this stuff, you'll find it. Yeah, and it's all free. Yeah, so there's no charge to any of this, even Tomato Sphere. I forgot, probably should have mentioned that at the beginning. <laughs> um, it's all volunteer run, so it's there's no charge for you guys. That's that's awesome. Um, so how has the pandemic uh, affected? Uh, yeah, so we had to transition all, a lot of our activities to virtual and some things don't transition very well. <laughs> um, so we it's been a bit slow. So we only started advertising out our virtual activities this past term. So in January. So we ran a few workshops already and it's been going well, but it's uh, I think educator has been very like it's been busy for them to like kind of managing everything. So I imagine uh, it's been a slow. And for us, we have uh, fewer volunteers because our volunteers are undergraduates and graduate students. Um, undergraduates are not actually on campus, so they're they're at home. Um, and graduate students have been extremely busy just because the research has been <laughs> uh, greatly affected by the pandemic. Yeah, that's that's too bad. It's probably gonna put things behind a little bit, right? It's yeah. Just, uh... But yeah, hopefully we can still provide uh, be available resources to educators that are interested, or even parents and stuff like that. Yeah. And is it any time throughout the year you can do the Tomato Sphere project, or do you time it with being able to plant outside? Um, ideally, if you can time it, so if you can get the seeds in spring or early summer, um, that would be ideal. Um, I guess you could do it. You could do it. I think they send it out in batches, but I'm not quite sure um, about that. Um, I know we have some seeds in our office that we've just been kind of lying around. Um, I'm imagining you can plant it. You can order it in winter time and just plant it indoors. So um, that's a good question. And and they're all the same variety of tomato. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> do you know, do you know what it is? Have you grown one? <laughs> no, not quite. <laughs> I know I should know this stuff, but, uh, <laughs> plants are not my expertise. Yeah. I was wondering if you get like a big beef steak or if it's the cherry tomatoes or if it's, uh, <laughs> uh I think they are bigger tomato. Um, let's see if I can find a picture of what the, Oh. It's, a, it's a pretty, pretty cool project for a school. Yeah, team. Not, that's a good question. You know what? I will ask my national department to find out what kind of tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it says here, uh, what kind of seeds are involved in the program? They are a variety of seeds from the Heinz company. So yeah. they are used for tomato paste and fresh. So I don't think they mention, oh, it's a plum, plum tomato. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Nice. Yeah. I mean, you want to know what you're getting if you're going to grow it, right? <laughs> yeah. We can do with it after. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And does the project, um, you need the results from like right from seed right until it starts producing fruit itself, or do you just need to know if it's going to germinate? That's, that's the project. Yeah. So the results that you're submitting um, is just whether or not it germinates. Uh, and I think I had a slide on kind of showing what the actual results are like. Uh, so it's really simple, like the results don't, we don't really, I don't think we need a lot. Um, most of it will be additional comments. So number of seeds planted, number of seeds germinated. I think that's all they really wanna know. But I think as a classroom activity or a group activity, I think it'll be interesting to see what the other characteristics are mm -hmm. uh, and kind of put them in the comments below. Um, yeah, because it'd be interesting to know if, you know, the radio, because some of them have been in space, like if it's affecting fruit production in the end, but uh, yeah. I guess that, that's another project. <laughs> <laughs> that's another uh, field of inquiry, I guess. But yeah. uh, this has been amazing. I really hope anybody who's a teacher out there does this. This seems like a fabulous project. Uh, I think I might be contacting, uh, <laughs> contacting you to get one of these yeah. for like all sorts of projects that Halton Foods involved in. Like it's just, mm -hmm. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, and if you're a parent or a student, um, you can refer uh, us to your teachers uh, and then your teachers can contact us to get us into your classroom store, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. 
Well, um, unless there's any more questions, um, it's been fabulous having you here. Thank you very much for joining us and telling us all about the, this project. I think it's worthwhile. Uh, one day we will probably live on another planet, so we need to get yeah. that first, right? Yeah, it'd be great to pioneer, <laughs> be the pioneer. <laughs> So thank you again for joining us. It's been it's been wonderful having you here today. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks very much for joining us.